Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing Hopper, specifically specifications which have leaked online for this upcoming architecture. Hopper will uh, follow Lovelace, and Lovelace will be the final monolithic architecture from NVIDIA. And then again, they will be switching to Hopper, which will be a chiplet design. And it will be interesting to see how NVIDIA can fare in the short term against RDNA 3, given, of course, that will be chiplet-based. They're basically fighting a, you know, chiplet-based architecture with a monolithic die. So if nothing else, that'll be curious to see how the uh, benchmarks kind of uh, end up there. But getting on to the uh, hopper side of the equation, uh, it seems that we're going to be looking at two chiplets for the highest end SKU, and Copity 7 Kimmy has given us the details. 28332 is what Copity has plonked on Twitter, and he then uh, clarifies that it's GPC, CPC, TPC, and SM. With SM, we're looking at 144 uh, total but the number of chiplets seems to be two. And we can also see how this compares against Ampere by looking at the RTX 3080 in this white paper. And again, you can quite easily see how um, the different characteristics of the Ampere architecture, you know, would break down versus this. And it's a very interesting notion to think of NVIDIA possibly being behind in terms of execution from AMD. But I don't think by any stretch of the imagination NVIDIA are in trouble. Even if uh, Lovelace was significantly slower than RDNA 3, um, the fact of the matter is that NVIDIA have so much mind share, I don't think it would necessarily hurt them in the long term to actually be behind. If anything, it might just motivate them to be even more aggressive for future architectures. And if there's one thing you can say about NVIDIA is that they don't like losing. They tend to be very, very, very good at rebounding from a failure. And again, I don't know um, if Lovelace will be a failure. In fact, I'm actually expecting it to be a pretty impressive architecture. But I think that NVIDIA will be leaning much heavier on technology such as DLSS to carry them through against uh, RDNA 3. And of course, by the time Hopper launches, well, we're going to be roughly within the time frame of RDNA 4. And Hopper is going to be absolutely ridiculous, not just because of the fact it's doubling the, you know, well, I guess the chiplet count, but we can expect huge architecture improvements by this point. And I believe that by the time RDNA 4 and Hopper do become kind of, you know, out and on mainstream, we're probably going to be in this situation where ray tracing in games is incredibly important. At the moment, it's definitely kind of the early dawn of ray tracing. You can see that developers are still experimenting. And in this, in my opinion, you know, some experiments are going quite well. Control was obviously a standout experience, despite the fact that it is very demanding. And other games, such as Resident Evil 8 Village, although it's not full ray tracing, for example, Ray Trace Shadows, but even so, it looks pretty darn good, right? I think it's fair to say that ray tracing in REA actually makes a palpable difference. But I think as we continue to evolve into the next couple of generations of graphics, uh, ray tracing is going to be a very much an important feature. And I feel that we're going to see some major advancements in this area alone. Going back to the Hopper side of the equation, though, I think Hopper is going to be a very interesting one to see the transition and how NVIDIA actually employ their chiplets versus what AMD are doing with RDNA. And uh, yeah, I think that the next couple of years in uh, graphics are going to be very curious. Obviously, at the moment, just everyone's on the knife edge simply because of all the hardware shortages. But I believe by the time RDNA 3 kind of rolls around, the shortages should be kind of starting to get resolved. And of course, by the time the next generation architectures launch, certainly by the time of Hopper's release, things should be a lot smoother sailing. And now we're going to move on to AMD, specifically some leaks for the 6600 and 6600 XT, courtesy of website Chip Hell. I'll link it in the video description. For the 6600 XT, we are looking at 2048 stream processors, and this is with 8 gigabytes of memory with 128 bit bus. Uh, apparently, it's scoring 9439 for time spine. 
And then the 6600, the non-XT variant, cuts things down just a little bit more. 1792 shaders, although it's still looking like the same bus width and also 8 gigabytes of memory. So AMD are definitely piling a ton of RAM onto their GPUs, which I think, you know, it's definitely a major selling point, to be honest, of RDNA 2. It's one of the things I do really like about the 6800 XT, is the fact that it's got 16 gigabytes of RAM. I don't necessarily know if it's needed now, but yeah, I, you know, more RAM is always a very good thing, and AMD have definitely been using that very effectively in marketing. This has definitely been a very GPU-focused video, because now we're going to move on to Intel, and specifically their Intel XEHP. These are GPUs which are designed around the data center, and Igor from Igor's Lab has actually an exclusive here which provides us not only photos of the card, of course you can find his article linked in the video description, but also some updates concerning the specifications. So for all these specifications of Intel Artix Sound, uh, also known as XEHP, we're looking at 7680 cores total, and this is for the two tile variant. Now, Igor has both one and two tile images. We'll get into those in just a second. But he believes the four tile GPU might be cancelled. Now, Raj Akadori himself has been teasing for quite a while now those GPUs, but he believes that um, there have been some issues with the bring up. So basically, the highest end uh, configuration of a tile, a single tile, would be 512. But he believes that uh, we're actually having some of the execution units disabled, with the two-tile variant um, only having 480 execution units. So this would mean that there are 7,680 shading units uh, available, rather than the full configuration, which would be 8,192. So the two-tile model also has 32 gigabytes of HBM2 memory and a TDP of 300 watts. And the Intel XE journey is definitely an interesting one. It seems that the gaming-focused cards are actually coming on rather well um, in terms of performance. We've discussed them a number of times at this point, but as a quick reminder, I've leaked before that it's around 3070 to 3080 levels of performance. I'm hearing the major drawback at the moment for those are the, you know, the actual drivers themselves. But the ironic thing was that the server parts for Intel were coming on rather well, and Arctic Sound, I was hearing, was actually doing rather well albeit it was apparently quite hot and power hungry. But now things seem to be changing. And in fact, I've myself have been hearing that, um, yeah, compared to let's say cDNA or NVIDIA's architectures, Intel's, you know, Intel's XE is extremely power hungry indeed. But Igor seems to believe that it's possible that Intel are having such problems with reduction of these cards. This is why there's only a two-tile variant, and he believes that it's possible that the four-tile variant has been scrapped entirely. So this could actually be quite interesting because it might mean that the gaming focus portion actually could be quite good, but the server portion might not be as good. I want to stress that at the end of the day, all of this is leaks and hearsay. Until Intel actually announces this stuff, until we actually get benchmarks and a proper disclosure from Intel, we're only kind of guessing, as with any of this stuff, actually what is and isn't true. And I do actually want Intel to be very competitive here, not only in the gaming side of the equation, but also the server market, because again, as I say 100 billion times at this point, Competition is only ever a good thing. Competition breeds innovation. And let's just be honest with ourselves. If RDNA 2 was not nipping at NVIDIA's heels, if they hadn't felt that AMD would be a really big threat for the RTX 30 series, would we have seen such aggressive pricing? Probably not. I mean, sure, you know, the shortages definitely didn't really help anyone at the end. But if things had been normal, let's say, I think it's fair to say that the pricing would definitely be a lot more competitive from NVIDIA simply because of what AMD were trying to do. So again, competition is only ever a good thing. I'm going to um, you know, default to Igor's information here because honestly, I've not heard too much about the server side of things, most of the gaming. I'm hoping it's not true, but as always, we can only wait and see. 
With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you've enjoyed it, you know what to do. Click the like button and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.